Good afternoon traders and welcome to this live Axia stream where we're going to be looking at how our elite Axia trader executed across a series of comments that came out relating to the US-China phase one deal on the 12th of December. This was a Thursday, um, it was also a day where we had ECB, um, which was Christine Lagarde's first meeting as head of the ECB. So there was quite a lot of expectancy built in um, and really we're going to get an amazing insight into how this trader executed with a new display that we're able to um, look at. So previously we've had some questions about how he executes because he essentially has a, um, a sister computer set up with all of the ladders compressed onto one screen which he records. So although you see the orders going in, you don't necessarily see him navigating from ladder to ladder. However, um, we've, he's now set up a new recording system which mirrors his exact main trading space. So we get even more insight into where he's looking, which markets he's paying more attention to, and can really see how he's kind of taking out prices, balancing his size, and utilizing you know, cross-market correlations to capitalize on these key moves that come as a result of these comments that came out. So just as a little bit of background, um, this was the 12th of December, and given 15th of December was the date that the, um, the, the latest round of tariffs was set to go in place on China, the market was quite kind of apprehensive coming into the end of the year, or certainly very sensitive to the fact that we were awaiting some news on this. Trump had been very quiet, which is quite unusual for him on the back of this US-China stuff. And really the market was starting to kind of um, get a little bit nervous as to what the result was going to be the closer we get to that date. In the event that the tariffs were to be imposed, we could potentially see some huge risk off coming into the market going into year end. Alternately, um, if the tariffs were finished, um, we could see a relief rally going into the end of the year. So it was kind of a real big theme. This also occurred on the Thursday, which was um, the day where we had the UK elections that night. So it was just one of those days where three big themes all kind of culminated into the same one or two day space. And we're gonna to get to see, you know, a real kind of close detailed view on how the top futures traders execute in this sort of scenario. So just starting with, just gonna give a little bit of a landscape. Now, the markets that this trader executes in across um, this US-China themed stuff is generally um, primarily gold and spoo. I think usually you'll see him go spoo first, then gold, then buns, and then copper. So obviously, if in a risk on situation, i.e. the tariffs were pulled, you'll expect to see the spoo get lifted and um, gold sell off. Equally, you'd see copper push higher as they're the, the world's largest importer of copper. Um, and you'd also see um, the bonds sell off. So in this situation, looking at the, the bun specifically, there were some kind of key reference points or targets which were in play, which will tie into his execution, which I'll explain a little bit further down the line when we're actually looking at his live screens. But just so you're aware, so this is where the Bund had traded up to the kind of point, I think this is the 2 p.m., the start of the 2 p.m. candle, which is pretty much going into the end of the press conference post ECB. Now, you can see here that we obviously, after the low of the day of Thursday, we had these subsequent lows lined up, which come in at 21s, 07s, 83s, and we do have a final one which comes in at 60s. But really, while these kind of three key levels were in play, it's gonna play into how he leans on the technical structure when knowing which markets he wants to retain the majority of his size in, um, and which ones he's willing to get out of as the kind of, the targets are hit, and then he's went, then willing to focus his um, attention on other markets. So this is just kind of the broad structure, but also overlaid onto this is ECBs, especially non-event ECBs, which this was, it was very balanced from Lagarde, very tight and constrained, she didn't really let anything go. We often have a move that comes in the afternoon once the press conference is finished. Um, whether this is because, you know, certain participants 
um, you know, like bigger, bigger participants in the market are just waiting for that risk to deplete that um, something will come out throughout the press conference um, before they start kind of positioning um, for the next however long. Um, but for whatever reason, the market kind of has a tendency to have these bigger extended moves afterwards. And what we're going to see in the first kind of few minutes of the footage is how even before um, the key kind of comment which came out at the hand of Trump, um, our elite trader was already positioned short in the buns. Now this is where we talk about a confluence of situations where you've got a technical structure that you're leaning on, you're also leaning on the back of um, ECBs quite often have a bit of a release in the afternoon afterwards and then when you get on top of that a real injection of new information that the market reacts quite kind of violently to, it puts all these three things together um, which gives a high probability situation which is where this trader really puts his foot down and really gets as much size away as possible. So just having a look at the 60 minute chart, you can see where these levels sort of came in as well. We'd been kind of grinding up, up to this sort of point where the press had finished. There was a little pop up and a failure um, at the start of the press conference. Um, and you can just see these lows are all quite vulnerable and a lot of empty space down here, which often means if it can get going, it can break through and really get some momentum as there's not really any um, support that comes in for a decent amount of time. So um, what I'm going to get to now, is there anything else? So these are the charts that we're going to be look at, looking at um, the five minute charts of each of the market, the BUN, gold, S&P, copper. Now the correlation between these is the key element which I'm going to talk about a lot as we go through and you know got some real kind of um, some great commentary um, from our elite trader um, that he's given that I'm going to kind of narrate um, some of the recording to as well but you can see that for the two main comments that we saw the first one's going to come in uh, just after half past two and the second one comes in at three o'clock, and then there is a smaller one just at the end of the day, which comes in just before 5 p.m. Um, but you can see how the correlations stack up. So you've got Bund and Gold, which sell off um, on positive news, and equally S&P and Copper both go up higher. So this is just something that's worthwhile having. You can relate back to this or flip back to it at any point um, throughout the stream to kind of get a bit of a um, visualization of where we're trading as we're only going to be looking at the ladders here. It's really a key part um, of how this trader executes. So getting onto the recording. Just going to start playing this at normal speed. I will vary the speeds at some point throughout today, but just want you to know this is the Bund. And what we have here is the old style, I'll refer to it as, as how he records his screen. So he gathers all his ladders together on one screen with his PL on the left hand side. So he's currently down, you know, 4K, pretty much flat on the day. You can also refer to the fills coming through here. Um, and what we're going to watch is um, how he's kind of, um, I'm just going to play this forward. Sorry, excuse me. So how he's already positioned short 220 lots in the Bund. Now, for those of you that aren't familiar with this trader, the way that he executes is commonly in with big size and then he'll lay smaller bids or offers to passively get filled as the market rotates down. So he's got 230 lots on, getting a little bit more size in here, you can see, and he's got two, 10, 10, and 10's laid all the way down. So if the market splashes through the low of the day, um, you know, it'll get filled on all of those orders. And then when it comes back, quite often we see him re-entering and rebuilding his position again. But also just want you to pay attention to, I think we have, um, copper here which is the one market which isn't on his main display which I'll see in a while but this is the old layout so we're going to watch the first couple of minutes of the biggest comment on here so you can see what copper does as well um, we have gold here and S&P here and then what I'm going to do I'm going to re-show this where we really focus down on his execution on his main 
display and talk a little bit about that. So you can see he's 160 lots. He's just kind of holding this position, targeting those levels. I think the first one came in around through 51s or somewhere along those lines, um, or 52s even, and then looking at 21s, 07s, um, and I think 83s was the last one. So just to bear in mind, but really at the moment, we're only focusing on the boom. The other markets more come into play when we get um, the real kind of risk on moves coming out. So I'm actually gonna fast forward this a little bit up to the comment, but I just think it's worthwhile you seeing how he's managing the position coming into the comment. Um, and obviously quite favorable given that, you know, he's already kind of worked much of this short trading down sort of 50 ticks and so. But you can see, again, this is four times the speed he's playing at the moment. As it looks like it's about to break through that level, he adds in another 10 lots, uh, sorry, 80 lots, and then starts scaling out again with twos, tens, 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 all the way down. So this is real kind of common style of how this trader likes to execute, uh, specifically on like technical breaks, etc., which we're seeing here through daily levels. Um, but really, as I said before, you know, it was relatively quiet, but we get these long extended grindy moves in the afternoons of an ECB. So we're going to watch the next kind of five minutes or so. It's just coming up to half past now, coming into the US Open. Also should, note, um, should notice that um, one thing that we had heard or was a kind of common view in the market was that if we were going to hear bad news from Trump, the likelihood was that it would come out over the weekend. So you can see this just start to release a little bit now. You know, he's already up 25K or so. You can see a little bit of risk on coming in with S&P just pulling back from the lows a little bit, but really not a huge amount of risk on risk off flow at the moment. It's kind of localized to the bonds. But as I was saying before, um, with the anticipation that if it was gonna be bad news, Trump would release it over the weekend, given that um, he'd like to put good news into open markets so he can reap the rewards as opposed to um, there being a bad reaction when the markets were open. Um, but because we're at the 12th, we only had the Thursday and the Friday left. You know, if there was going to be good news, we were kind of thinking that it should come out in the next couple of days. So again, as these, this is, you know, he's one of the, you know, best news traders that we have, certainly at Axia, but, you know, that, we, that I am aware of. And he's always kind of working these themes into his his focus, what he wants to execute in. You know, he already knows what markets, like, you know, as a natural instinct, he's gonna be hitting. This situation is gonna be a little bit different in the fact that he's already in the bun, so his attention's already focused on there. Otherwise, he would have been going S&P, copper first. So I'm just gonna take this back down to normal speed. And what we had, was a tweet that came out by Donald Trump, as seen in the corner here, um, which says, getting very close to a big deal with China, they want it and so do we. Now, certainly from my perspective, I read this and I was a little bit like, he says this all the time. There's, he's always getting close to a big deal, but one of the key kind of differentiators here was the fact that the market was waiting to hear what he was gonna say. The fact that he'd been quiet had kind of said a lot. And this is something that I'm gonna go over later on a little bit more as well in that, you know, you have to kind of judge some of these comments in the context of where we are in the overall theme because they can be, you know, the importance of a, what could seemingly be a minor comment can really be amplified um, in the event that the market's really waiting and hinged on um, you know, what's going to happen with regards to these tariffs. So, you know, this, at this situation is a real kind of green light setup. Also, just to note, you know, we've got the levels coming in, 21s, 07s in the bund. You know, they're kind of between 30 and 50 ticks away. 
you know, there's some real good targets for you to aim for, and the market can often release going into those areas as more and more participants are aware of these key levels in play, and it kind of pushes the market or it gravitates it towards them. Um, so what we're going to watch now is how he executes. But as you can see, you can't see his cursor moving around. You're just seeing the orders being laid. And you know, we get a lot of questions in this scenario that is it algorithmic trading? Is it hotkey? And the answer is no. To be fair, it's just we're all point and click traders at Axia, which we're going to see a lot more evident on the next screen. So playing this normal speed, it's currently up 17K on the day. 87 lots short in the Bund, and really pay attention, there's gonna be a lot of action that comes on your screens any second. So that comment comes out. He's tried to get filled, he's 80 lots front of the queue at 51s, and it's actually trading into that price, three lots, two lots, but he doesn't get any of it away. And he's very unfortunate actually to be left offered at 51s, as we're gonna see in a second. So the comment comes out, Bund blips down six ticks, he pressures escape to cancel all of the bids that he's, he's got in. You know, he's up to 300 lots short in the Bund, um, added 270 lots long in the S&P, and 200 lots short in the gold. I'm going to go through this a little bit more closer when we re-watch this in a second on his main screen, as I've got some good kind of narrative from our elite trader to, um, to mention. But just to note, he's not in the copper yet because you won't see the copper on the next screen. But I think he gets in with 80 or 90 lots in a second. But really, in this sort of situation, the gold and the S&P are really the lead markets. You can just see he's entered 90 lots long in copper. Gold's pushing lower. S&P's pushing through its highs. He's 350 lots long now in the S&P. 375 lots short in gold in, in the Bund. 130 lots short in gold and 88 lots long in the copper. So across four markets, you know, at one point he's, brought, he's nearly what, getting close to 1,000 lots or 800 lots across the kind of four markets. But you can see he's onside in all of them, working his, utilizing his usual um, execution strategy of getting in with big size and then scaling out with smaller clips. And now it's just a case of staying with the trade as long as the kind of energy's there that he's expecting to see. He's already up 200K on the day, you know, so really capitalizing on this move from now. As S&P is pulling back to 52 and three quarters, he's getting in with another 75 lots. Really, just as long as he's seeing the energy in the markets, trying to stay in there. So just to cover some of the things that he mentioned, as, um, which I wanted to reiterate here. So he was unlucky not to get his 80 lot off offer filled at 51s. Um, but his first reaction as he was trading the Bund was to press the skate, pull all his bids, as you saw there, um, and then smash with a few big clips and then instantly moved to Spoo, where he did four big clips of 70 lots, um, then four clips in gold of I think around 40 lots each, um, and then another one in gold and another one in Spoo as he started going on side. Then he lays his bids and offers, so he's ready to kind of get pinged out of some as it um, rotates, but in very small size. Um, but for him, this is a kind of psychologically aiding execution style. And what I mean by that is, you know, he mentions this a lot that he just likes to be busy. He likes to be busy, likes to be clicking, but he doesn't necessarily want that to mean that it's getting him out of a large proportion of his size because he knows that the longer that he stays with these trades, you know, the, if he can stay with it to exhaustion, he's generally going to get across the board, you know, a much higher return than if he's kind of smashing and then getting out quite quickly. Um, and it also allows him to get a bit of a feel of which markets are still moving higher. As, you, as your peripheral vision is trying to navigate across four different ladders, you can see where the market swept and taking you out of some of your, um, your resting bids or offers that you've left in and then pulled back. So you can kind of gain a bit of an insight you know, in your periphery as to what the rotations are like in that market, which ones have pulled back the most, which I'm going to talk about again 
um, in a stecker, second. But one thing that you'll note is he gets out with kind of very small clips until he really wants to cover and that's when you see him kind of getting out with these bigger clips um, and kind of being much more aggressive with his exit strategy. So now what we've got here is what I mentioned before. This is the real kind of new thing that we have to go on for these execution streams. And really, for me, you know, it's very, very lucky. You know, it's not very often you get to see um, a trader of this size, um, his screen, and be able to see exactly what he's doing and how he's navigating through these markets. So just to give you some um, idea of where we are, we have Buns here. Um, this is the bobble. We have gold, spoo, um, and on this side we have euro, books all, and then we have BTP and cable. But really, m the main focus should be in these three markets. As I said before, copper isn't on this screen, so what he has is. Um, sorry, I failed to mention he also did three clips in copper in copper. Um, which has a different kind of weight characteristic of its reaction. But copper's not on this screen. He's, he's set up as essentially he has, I think, two or three of these kind of screens of ladders, um, but it's only the main one that he drags the kind of the key markets which he's focusing on based on the theme or the event that he's trading onto his main screen. So that's what we're looking at. And we're now going to look at the, this in a slightly different way where we get to see um, his his execution um, with his mouse. So really pay attention to the cursor and where it is because it often shows which market he's kind of focusing on at the same time. So this is still at normal speed and we're going to um, watch it again. But this is really where it gets quite interesting. But again, you're going to see this is identical to the previous screen. It's just a different display that allows us to look at it. We can see it 51s, as I said before, front of the queue, um, 51s, but doesn't get filled. But just watch how quickly his mouse kind of navigates. Adds in buns, then moves over to spoo, gold, three clips each, then another one in spoo and gold, and then he's off the page looking to copper. So he's in with the buns, long S&P, 280 lots, short gold, now he's starting to lay, he's just added another clip into spoo and gold, he's left his buns for where they are at the moment, really paying most of his attention to the thinnest markets, now trying to get another 80 lots into bund up to 400 lots, so you can see how he's kind of in with like three clips, then everything goes on, when everything goes on side, he uses that opportunity just to get one more clip away and then he starts distributing his bids and offers. Now, I appreciate the mouse is moving very quick. Also notice when it goes off the screen, that's when he's attending to his copper position. But you can see he's adding another clip into the highs in Spoo as he's really getting the confirmation that, you know, this is the information that the market's waiting for. The reaction that we've had off the bat is perfect. He's onside, he's in a very comfortable position where he's onside and he can just kind of manage each of the positions um, without being put under pressure too much in each individual one. Now, one thing I'm going to talk about now is how he attends to each market um, dependent on, you know, is there still energy in, in the theme? Now, what we can see is the spoo's still very much at the highs, the gold's making new lows, but the bund has pulled back quite significantly. Now, in isolation, you may think that right, he's kind of gone ten, he's pulled back 10 ticks in the bund from 25s to 35s. You know, maybe he should start covering that position. But as the S&P keeps pushing new highs and he's adding into that position and the gold's still rotating lower, what he's doing, he's leaning on these two markets, gold and spoo, as the kind of lead markets in this scenario, knowing that they generally extend, extend, extend till they overextend to keep him in this bund position and in fact get some more size away on a pullback to 37s. He's now back up to 380 lots. And this is where the real kind of, you know, the slickness of the, the execution comes into play because 
He knows that as long as the S&P and gold are pushing their extremes, we've still got levels coming in at 21s and 06s, I think it was in the Bund. You know, the chances are that this Bund is gonna roll over. It just may take some time. As I said before, that SPU and gold have the characteristics of really kind of pushing and overextending um, until the move's exhausted. On this US China stuff, what we've seen is the gold, um, sorry, the Bund, it generally has one big splash, then a pullback, and then it either reverses the whole thing or does nothing, or it rolls over. But what he's aware of is that it's not, it's not against you know, a probable outcome that the Bund could roll over from here. So there's value in holding this trade as we're still seeing S&P and gold push the extremes of the move. Similarly, or equally in copper, you know, copper reacts in a very different way in what he explained to me that, you know, copper can um, often have a less aggressive kind of initial move, but then it can just grind and actually trend for a long period of time. So again, he adjusts his execution accordingly. What you may have noticed on the previous screen where we could see the copper is he's just kind of happy just to sit in the position, not scale out of too much, and just let it go because if it starts to drift, you know, he's really going to capitalize out of it. But really back to where we are now, you know, he's started to deplete his gold and S&P positions down to about 50 lots. The move's been going for four minutes or so. You know, Bund, he's done very well to stay in that position and now it looks like it's starting to come good. He's currently up 265k on the day. Um, still seeing a bit of energy in the S&P. But what he'll rarely do now is start lumping in like quite aggressively at this phase in the move into gold and spoo. You know, he's very good at, you know, he takes the opportunity to get his size on when it's there, but then it's all about managing, you know, how much um, he's open PL effectively. Um, and then just trying to stay with the position to see if we get another leg. In which case, you know, he may get more back into spoo and gold, but I think it would be unlikely unless it was a really significant new bit of information, which we are gonna see in a second actually, that he's going to start getting up to the same sort of size. But as you can see his cursor moving around now, I think he's currently tending to his copper position. So his cursor's come back and he's kind of just deciding how many bids and offers he wants, moving some of them around, you know, navigating this spoo and gold position. But really what he said to me is, as he depletes his gold and S&P position, his attention then shifts to where the kind of biggest, you know, open P&L exposure is, or just the main kind of position is, which is back to the Bund. And this is how you can really get an insight into what he's doing. You can see he's just looking at where he's kind of resting his bids after that whole kind of, um, sorry, his offers even in the SPU, after that big kind of high intensity um, you know, five minutes. Now it's just kind of right, check that my house is in order, um, you know, see that I haven't got any crazy bids or offers left up the, on my ladders. Just make sure that, you know, I'm not gonna get pinged in accidentally on an 80 lot or something like that in gold, but really just kind of time to calm, time to see, is this gonna trend? Do I wanna be getting any more size on? And really, after this decision-making process, you can see he's very kind of organized and structured in the way that he's bouncing from one ladder to another. I know it seems quite crazy when you're on the price screen and you've got like, you know, 12 or so ladders all moving at the same time, but really it's all about focusing your attention on like the, the, the areas that are gonna really give you the most reward. And you can see now he's actually starting to work more size into Bund as it seems to be a bit of a lagger in this scenario. Gold and Spoo have both had a little pullback but are now starting to go and take out some of the resting bids and offers that he's laid. And now he feels that really the opportunity kind of lows, lies in, um, in the bun. So just some comments that he made here at 42 minutes past, which is pretty much where we are now. So he's adding more into buns. I was looking to add when I felt it was going to smash those lows um, as he was pretty much out of other market. He was looking at a break through 02s to 06s, was the first target, which were daily lows. And the bun kept chopping while drifting lower until 3 p.m., which we're gonna see as we kind of fast forward through a little bit of this in a moment. Um, but he's constantly managing the trade. So we'll add, 
but then if he kind of goes offside a little bit in those that he's added, he will be willing to puke those. And you know, he's not kind of, he doesn't want to mess up these positions, especially when he's built, you know, a significant core position as he has done in the Bund and sat through probably the hardest part of the squeeze, which came all the way back to, I think it was 37s or 38s. You know, now it's just about staying calm, thinking logically and objectively, where is this market going to go? You know, there's nothing realistically that's going to come into the buns, given that they were already looking to sell off, and now we've had this big risk on come into the market. There's no real reason for these to suddenly move and go higher. Granted, they can do that. The markets can do anything at any one time. But if you're looking at what's the most probable scenario, really it's to hold this position, which is what we see him do so well, where he's really willing to sit on these bigger positions and just let the market do the move, which is something that certainly as a junior trader, you can be quite guilty of. Every time there's a pullback, you're kind of over managing the trade and losing sight of the bigger picture, which is the fact that you've got some clear daily levels that are about 20 or 30 ticks away. Market looks like it's gravitating towards them. Just let it do the work itself. Um, we're also going to see um, in a second, he's going to replace his bobble ladder with um, his T notes. I think we'll watch it at normal speed up to then. I think this comes in, oh, that's maybe in about 10, 10 minutes or so, but maybe just spend a bit of time. We'll just look at now as the Bund starts to make new lows, how he's managing that position. You know, he doesn't restack the bid immediately every time it pulls back because, again, that would mean he's potentially getting out of too much of his size, but he is starting to see a little bit of a bounce now. He's out of his S&P position. He's only 10 lots short in gold, which really, I know it's still like a decent position for many of us, but he's pretty much out. He's now only down to say three lots in gold, as gold's actually looking to make a new low now, which again will give him more conviction in staying in this bun position, as it really looks like it's approaching um, the low of the day at 25s. He's just added another 80 lot, into 27s and actually just gone two ticks offside immediately. So, you know, still managing as it goes offside. He restacks the bid with the 10 lots. Still quite a heavy position, but just the fact that he manages to hold this bund, you know, he's only ever dragging his average price down a little bit, two ticks, three ticks at a time max, um, and always trying to stay on side in the trade. That's when he's most comfortable. That's when really we, start, we, we generally see that unless he goes offside, there's no reason to start getting out, um, you know, aggressively. But here I would say, you know, as my best guess, not that I can read his mind, that, you know, I think the high that was made of the pullback was around 37s or 38s. It would be unlikely that he'd start puking up until that moment. You know, he's up 270K on the day, um, which is a very good day. Um, obviously, but this trader is always pushing to have his like best ever day, which I think you know from one of the previous streams that we've done comes in at around 500. So he's always in the back of his mind, right? You know what are we waiting for? We also have to note that Trump talks a lot and he kind of says you know a load of stuff. Chances of there being a denial is quite kind of it's not as high now on the fact that we've had that tweet from Trump, because it would normally be Trump who comes out and says, oh, that comment's rubbish that's come out. Um, but he's also always paying attention to the fact that when he's got a heavy position on like he does in the Bund, you know, potentially there could be something counter to um, the information that we've had that could put a little bit of risk off into the market, in which case you'd see probably a very aggressive, you know, smash and grab um, the opposite way in each of these markets. So I'm actually going to fast forward this a little bit now just because we've got so much to get through and I want to make sure that we have enough time. So this is up to four times the speed now, but you kind of get the gist for he's still adding in as it pulled back to 29s there, I think. Um, and now the bun makes its new low and really he's kind of, he's got the plate loaded and it starts to just release down now. You know, he steps up um, the amount that he lays resting on the bid um, as the kind of range extends just in case there's a little flick down it will get filled on a little bit more and it's just these small kind of little changes to his execution which really when they're all put together you know creates such a huge kind of amount of edge on these type of scenarios
But still, as he said before, despite the bun chopping, it's still chopping and rotating lower. So it's still kind of moving down, albeit not very comfortable. But some of the best moves that we see, you know, especially in the bun, you know, they're, they're not always the easiest to stay in. That's why they can kind of end up keep on going. Um, but you're always going to get these kind of, you know, weaker participants who add into lows and then as it extends the range by a couple of ticks and then comes back inside, you know, they kind of get squeezed and they might puke their position and it creates this kind of rotating effect um, towards the low. But we can see now the spoo's kind of pushing towards its high of the day, about to extend the range as is gold. You can see his cursor starting to move around a little bit around those markets, um, but he's actually hovering over the offer. So he's kind of ready um, to get some more in, in the event that everything starts to go again, potentially. But as you can see, it's, it, it's, it's not an algorithm, but he kind of operates like an algorithm. It's a mechanical system overlaid on a kind of, um, you know, a, a strategy which, you know, is very much kind of flow driven, you know, the way that he sees the flows in each of the market. But it then applies a very mechanical execution process or strategy which allows him to utilise on that. You know, it'd be very easy to have the right view but just kind of get squeezed out a lot of all the positions or get heavy into the extreme too much relative to your original position. Um, but he hasn't gone offside from this average price once. Now I know that's not his, his actual average price because he's scaled out of so much as he's kind of moved on. Um, but just to kind of keep himself below there, mentally it allows you to feel like you're still on side in the trade, just it's still working. Now I'm just gonna switch quickly back to normal speed. But what we then had, which adds another kind of layer of um, complexity to this story, really is where it gets even more interesting. We had a tweet that came out from Walter Bloomberg, who I don't even know who this guy is, but you know, we follow him and sometimes you know, he's had some good information, but it's this bottom tweet which we became aware of on the floor. And it said, US negotiators, offered to cut existing tariff rates by up to 50% on 360 billion of Chinese imports. Now, is this old news? Now, straight away, we're all thinking, is this old news? But then also we're thinking, if that is true, everything that we've been talking about up to now and everything we thought that um, Trump was talking about with relation to phase one was regarding the new tariffs, I think it was 160 billion at 25%, which were gonna come into effect on December 15th. Now this kind of infers that they're potentially looking to cut the existing tariff rates, which is 360 billion, which is even bigger than what we had expected. It also plays into some of the commentary that we'd had from China, which said to the extent that they were only really looking to get the phase one done if the US were prepared to cut the existing tariffs, not just the new ones. Now, it'd be very unlikely that um, the US would agree to get rid of everything, but this is a real shift in the state of play. And as we saw this, what you're gonna see is he doesn't react immediately. And I think this is so important to be able to see where his cursor is, what he's looking to um, execute in, because we get these sort of comments all the time where we're generally saying to each other, is this new? Is it big? If it's big, if it, sorry, if it is new and it's confirmed, then it's massive. And what we're going to see now, um, let me just say, give you a bit of narrative from him. So he said, with the turn of the hour, so we're just coming up to three o'clock. Um, and while the, the Wall Street Journal sources started to get more attention, which is this kind of bit of news, which is then kind of confirmed by the Wall Street, Street German, um, it felt that we had another leg of risk on. So he buys the high in spoos, so we need to pay attention to there. And again, I'm gonna talk about a little bit of the way he differs his execution strategy when he's buying um, at the, or selling at the extreme. So um, he's buying spoo again, and he was short bunned. He was prepared to stay in there until it took O2. So he's still got, 20 tick target or so through the low in booms. Um, but he knew that if it was a second leg, 
it would probably be quite choppy as we'd already had a big move. Now again, this is something that we can really read into and build into our own um, expectation of how things are gonna play out, which can quite often keep you in the trade. Um, and also, if I was buying the highs, it'd be very quickly, it'd be very quick to puke um, in the event that it came against him, just in case there was an aggressive snapback. He wouldn't wanna take too big a hit with big size in a thin market in high volatility such as gold and S&P. So let's watch now as this story starts to get a bit of traction. It's not one of those ones where it comes across the headline as a clear headline. It kind of drifts into the, into the market, starts coming and getting retweeted across various feeds. The markets start reacting a bit. And then when you get the confirmation as we did from the Wall Street Journal, that's when the markets really sprung into life and he got mega aggressive again. So just see, he's not really paying attention to anything now. I think this is probably where we were kind of talking about it and saying, you know, can anyone see what he's referring to? Is it old news? Have we heard them talk about this before? But you can see the S&P and gold both start to push their extremes. There's a 200 lot sat on the bid in gold. You'd start to think, right, if that gets hit aggressively, you could think that maybe there's a new flow of risk on coming into the market. So Spoo's just making a new high. Still managing his bun position, short 265 lots. I mean, this is quite slow, the reaction, but that's what you kind of get when no one knows. Everyone's waiting for it to be confirmed or for it to hit the news wires. But now we start to see some aggressive moves come through. You know, he's hovering over the offer in the Bund, tries to get another 80 lots away, misses a fill on the first one at 20s, hits into the low, 80 lots at 18s. You know, starts adjusting his um, resting bids as the range extended. As I said before, he always likes to have them just loaded up a little bit more. But now, as this starts to get a bit more traction, just note where his attention starts to shift to the Spoo and Gold. And he starts rebuilding that position similar to what he had on before. He's up 300K on the day now. So really pushing to kind of, you know, potentially this could be a scenario you could have your best day ever. But interestingly, he hasn't reacted and gone into the S&P and gold yet. And I think that's quite logical at this time. You know, why buy the high? on a rumor essentially it's in the market, but you can see now it's really starting to get some traction. He's added again at 18s into his bin position, up to 330 lots. You know, S&P and gold pinned to the extremes, both the high and the low. As I said before, he's brought T-notes in so he can get a view of the US bond markets as we come into the US session. But now he's executed 130 lots long into the highs in Spoo. Just see now, you can see he's hovering over the offer. He's just managing his boom position a little bit, but really his focus is on this S&P position. He's actually out of sort of, you know, 40% or so of that position quite quickly, pretty much for a scratch. As I said before, he's just wary that there could be an aggressive snapback if this was to go. He knows he's got um, sixes and twos in the bund which are kind of his final areas that he'd expected to go to. But as the S&P looks like it's starting to make another leg, Bund's looking like it's gonna release through that level, starts adding back into the high. He's up to 220 lots now, but very careful. His cursor hovering over this offer does not wanna get caught long from the high if this snaps and reverses. But what we wanna pay attention to is now, as this S&P position starts to go a little bit more comfortably on side, where his attention goes to. He's added a bit more into these O2, into these buns, as the O2s are still, you know, intact. S&P starting to go on side quite nicely to 160 lots. But really just managing these two positions. I don't know if he gets into gold or not, but the thinking may have been, well really, I mean, it was kind of late to be getting get into the spoo. It had already gone five, 10 handles when he was buying the high, you know, maybe it's too late. You don't want to be getting into the gold too aggressively 
as it's pinned to the lows. But from recollection, I think, I think he does. Okay. So about now, I think we're going to see him start going to uh, gold. He says, um, at two minutes past three, um, the Wall Street, Journal st Wall Street Journal story eventually um, gets markets going for another leg. Um, he sells the low of the gold, but only after the mega move, but not too much size. And that's where he's kind of really adjusting his aggression based on you know, the, um, the news that's out. Now what we get to, as you can see here, US negotiators offered to cut existing tariff rates by up to 50% on 360 billion of Chinese imports, sources say. Now this comes through an official newswire, not just Twitter, and really this is the confirmation we were really looking for. Um, so as that comes out, the market gets its confirmation, and really what you'd expect now is like a final kind of push, but to understand that potentially, you know, this is where the exhaustion leg's gonna come, and you could potentially get a bit of um, a snap reversal after that, so always trying to be aware. But as that gets confirmation on the wires, he's added another 60 lots into the high in S&P. Probably hasn't made like a huge amount out of this S&P position yet, but, you know, the fact that he's got the kind of open risk in that market and he's holding that position, you know, there's opportunity in holding through this just for one kind of final flow. Buns was held just above that O2 levels that he was eyeing. But the S&P's still pushing through extremes. He tries getting, or he does get added on another 60 lots, I think. But you see, he doesn't mind if he adds into a price and then it goes off it at that price, he'll still scale out of 10 lots and scratch 10 lots of it. It's more like not kind of overthinking it too much unless you can see across multiple markets you're coming under pressure. Now he sells pretty much the absolute low, 40 lots in gold. But again, relatively minor position compared to what we've been seeing from him um, up to now. He's currently up 365K in, on the day. Like huge, huge numbers he's starting to print now. And S&P really starting to release. He's on side in his gold position, but not getting too crazy in that really at the moment. Bund position, you know, he still kept adding in all the way down and just managed to kind of hold. He's still got 250 lots on. You know, his max he was at 350. His lowest, I think he was down to 100 lots. But now it's starting to release through that O2 level. And really now he'd probably be thinking... I assume he'd be thinking, right, my, my key target levels are done in the Bund. He's starting to scale out a little bit more aggressively. You can see he's now down to 120 lots in the Bund, 20 lots in gold, 30 lots in the S&P. Just see, he's still looking at kind of hovering his cursor on the offer. He's adding a little bit more into the gold as he feels like that market's potentially got a bit further to go. Okay, and now what we get to, so I just cut that short, that sort of shows him kind of executing and working himself out of that position um, because we haven't got all the time to watch all of it, but it's largely from that point the same strategy. When his targets have been hit, he's then just looking to deplete his size and reduce his exposure in all of those markets because really that's what you've got to have. You've got to have a reason to stay in the trade and then a reason to get out, but there's no point pushing or getting more aggressive when really you've kind of already met your targets. It's something that as a junior trader we can all take and work into our own execution because it's quite often that you know you end up getting too aggressive at too late a stage in the move mainly from my perspective is usually because I didn't get enough size on earlier on and that's how his execution strategy really satisfies him because he gets all of his size on early and then it's just a matter of managing those levels until he sees his um, targets hit and then he kind of goes into scale out mode where he's kind of he's not adding back into the markets as aggressively. Now fast forward to just before five o'clock um, and just some commentary here. So a very reputable CNBC reporter who has inside knowledge of talks between US and China and has moved markets with tweets in the past um, says that um, reports of US offer on the trade deal causing a stir tonight in Beijing. 
One Chinese expert tells me he thinks um, China would continue to push back on agreeing on hard targets on super huge agricultural purchases, even with a Trump offer to reduce tariffs. Now, we often have that when there's a big kind of injection of new information in the market. There will sometimes be contradictory subsequent um, news that comes out, but the rationale that this trader has is it's the first negative comment since the huge risk on, although I don't expect this to be a game changer as we had multiple sources indicating that a deal is very close. He still expect a reaction. You've got to think, you know, some people may be positioned, you know, for risk on across multiple markets. The market's kind of overextended. So, you know, when you've had a big move one way, it's a lot easier for there to be a bit of a reaction to kind of retrace a proportion of that. Um, but it's more of a smash and grab trade. So he sells SPU and bought Golden Bund. However, just to note, I think when we pay attention to the gold, um, he, sh he feels like he should have got out earlier. He let the gold come all the way back and he says, these mini denials sometimes tend to react aggressively and wipe out many people who are short, but tend to get retraced. Um, eventually in this situation, they drifted his way. Um, so added a bit to the day, but even by his own words, you know, I think he said he was a bit fortunate that the gold does come back. So let's just watch this again. This is in real time. Um, he's up 395K on the day at the moment. Very quiet, nothing really moving. And he hears this comment straight away short, 210 lots, first in S&P, then in gold, 120 lots long in gold, and then long 160 lots long in the bun. So that's such a good comment um, to be able to see his reaction time where it's Spoo, three or four clips, a couple in gold or three in gold, and then uh, two or three in the bund as well. And now he's just managing this position, but as he said before, you know, you want to execute this more like a smash and grab. Chances of this then trending off the back of that comment, which doesn't really change anything from a bit bigger picture perspective, you know, is quite unlikely. But here is where in the gold, if you pay attention, he says that really, you know, he should have got out quicker than he did because I think he was about you know, 20, 25 ticks on side at one point, and he lets it come back, but fortunately, it holds broadly above his um, entry, and then starts to rotate higher. And we'll just look at the Bund as well. You know, he's not really paying too much attention to the Bund, because most of his exposure in this sort of situation is in these two thinner markets, gold and S&P. But just seeing he's actually gone offside in all three of them here. And this is where he says he was a little bit fortunate that it kind of rotated and pushed back after that initial kind of, um, you know, retracement of the mini denial reaction. So he's actually gone offside in all three markets, as I said before, but starting to work them out, start to be quite prudent. Now, I'm actually gonna fast forward through the remainder of this at four times the speed, just so we can see how he manages this position. But you will become familiar with how he executes. You know, as I said before, it's like a mechanical strategy that he applies. And by doing it the same way every time, kind of knows when it's working or not. You know, this is how his strategies evolved over the past 10 years of trading. Um, and we've even got to see it evolve in the past two years of looking at his execution through these streams. You know, in that time, his size has gone, um, you know, from maybe 120, 150 being his sort of top end in the Bund. Now he's pushing 400 lots. You know, S&P, think 100 lots he used to have. Top end size, now he's got 300 lots, which he's getting on on these biggest comments. So we're really seeing the progress, you know, in real time of such a kind of, a huge trader. He's up 430k on the day, you can see in this bottom box. And as I said before, positions start to come back and really, I don't think he probably makes that much out of gold and s and I forget what he was, probably 30 grand across the three markets on this, um, on this move. But really not looking to get more size in without seeing a real kind of flow, being that he's effectively trading against the trend, be it the kind of risk on trend or risk on theme you'd expect to come through on this day as a result of the kind of US-China reconciliation. So I think I'm going to leave that there because I've got a few points 
um, that really want to get through. So just coming back to some key takeaways. Now, I was really fortunate to spend some time chatting through um, this trader's execution. You know, he spends a lot of time going through, making notes, reflecting on what he did well, what he could have done better. And this is all part of the process, you know, that allows him to kind of keep on improving and really growing his size. Even when you think, you know, he's already at his biggest size, he still keeps pushing forward. So just some of the key takeaways, but they're just some kind of key notes that it's worth kind of registering about his execution um, in, the, in the kind of the stream or the various comments that we've just seen. So the first one, the timing of a comment can amplify significance and expected market reaction. So as I said before, you know, it's really important that Trump tweet, you know, he's said that so many times, you know, we're gonna get a big deal, the deal's gonna be great, you know, over and over and over again. But if he's been quiet for that long and the market's really waiting for it, you know, that's gonna be the trigger to set it off. So you've kind of got to wait these comments appropriately um, in a relative to kind of the environment or where we're, where we're currently sitting. So the market kind of context or the theme context, I would rather say. Um, the second one, when he's in multiple markets, he identifies the laggers while the leading markets are still pushing the extremes. So you could see in that situation, you know, to hold that boom position, you know, that's where the real, any, I say anyone, but it's a lot easier to learn how to just smash on a comment and ride it out for kind of 20, 30 ticks or a couple of minutes or so, and then get out. The real kind of skill comes in knowing when the move hasn't been exhausted. In that bund, you know, Spoo and Gold were still pushing extremes. Bund, yes, it had pulled back 10, 12, 13 ticks, but there was kind of 30 ticks of upside to the downside, be it through those levels, O2s, O6s, etc. So really kind of kept him in that trade um, and didn't give him any real reason to panic, just keep rational. Yes, yeah, scale out of a little bit, but as you feel like another leg's potentially coming to the risk on to get a little bit more. And by identifying those laggers, you know, it can open up some of these moves in, as long as there's energy across the four markets, it can really keep you in in the trade as a whole from a bigger perspective by shifting your kind of risk or uh, focus to each market as there shows more opportunity or value in being in it. Um, thirdly, the mini denials, you wanna apply the smash and grab execution strategy. As I said before, this is kind of, you know, a small denial um, or a small counter um, comment to a very big comment. So let's not get carried away thinking it's gonna reverse the whole thing. Granted, one in 10 times, it might just set the market off in that direction, but not unless there's kind of some other real reasons, some other kind of news um, from a different theme or a real conflicting technical structure or something along those lines. And then finally, you know, apply product-specific execution strategies to accommodate the varying characteristics of theme-driven moves. And that's why it's so important. You know, this trader records his screens, he'll go back and watch the moves because as a theme starts to evolve, now this is a really kind of, this is the tail end of what's been, you know, a one, two year theme with the US China stuff. So you start to learn how each individual markets react. So in this situation, gold and spoo, they generally kind of have a big move and then potentially come back, consolidate, and then a second leg or another retracement all the way around. Um, Bund will have a spike, a pullback, and then a consolidation, and then maybe a grind down um, on the US China stuff. Copper has less of an initial move, but just will potentially grind and trend for the rest of the day. And just understanding that that's what you're expecting to see. You shouldn't expect copper to just kind of spring and take off. So maybe it means, right, I shouldn't scale out as aggressively. I might have to just sit on this. I might have to sit offside a few ticks or so, so long as the others are going. Equally with the bund, like it might be a good strategy, as he sort of said to me, that you know, if you get a good price in the bund, scale out of half of it really aggressively on that first splash and then try to work the position in the pullback, you know, but give it a bit more time to roll over. And then, equally with the spoo and gold, you know, once they have extended and if they finish with a flush and a pop and start to pull back, you know, there's no real value in holding um, your size in those markets. So 
what he's doing is overlaying you know various bits of knowledge from the technical landscape his understanding of the theme um, to his unique execution strategy that he applies you know as far as a kind of mechanical system for getting in and out of trades but then tweaking that accordingly depending on what uh, market is in and he's doing this all at the same time with massive size in four markets you know that's why you know he's reaping the rewards that he has but it all comes through you know failure repeat adjustment to his execution strategy um, and to really kind of grow his performance in the way that he's done. So, you know, really that was such a good insight for me. I hope you really enjoyed it. Just being able to see and watch, you know, where his eye is tending to, you know, it gives just another layer of understanding as to kind of what he's thinking, even whether he's hovering over the bid or the offer, kind of gives a bit of um, an idea of whether he's looking to get more aggressive or less aggressive. Plus, you can also see, you know, where he's taking out prices with bigger clips. This is something that I haven't understood really without seeing it because I don't trade big enough um, size to take out those prices. But you can see it in the bund when he's clipping kind of, you know, 240 lots. It's taking out, um, you know, the bid and trading through that price and then trading into the next one as he's hitting his market. So, all really interesting stuff. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and you know, 2020 is going to be like another year where hopefully we can keep pushing, you know, the the boundaries of what we can achieve, and hopefully we'll have some more streams for you from our elite Axia trader. So trade well. I'm back with you soon. Cheers.